So here we are slowly but surely making our way through 2020 and into the fall. Finally, it gets a little more chilly out, it gets darker sooner, and there are plenty of opportunities for hot tea or a pumpkin spice latte if that's your calling. One of my favorite parts of the fall season is the fact that all of the fun holidays are coming up, which means plenty of time to get festive and crafty. And I love decorating my little house for the holidays, Halloween, Christmas, whatever, I love it. So if you're going to decorate, then of course, you'll most likely stop at a craft store at some point to pick up some supplies and decorations. And there are many local and chain stores to choose from, obviously. But today I am going to potentially narrow down that list for you by one store, because today we are going to be discussing the ethics and practices of one craft store in particular. And what is talked about today in this video might just change your mind about giving them your hard earned money in the future. So hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we are talking about Hobby Lobby. And let me just put a giant disclaimer in front of this video before we even get started. CEOs and business founders are allowed to have their own beliefs. If the owner of Hobby Lobby is religious, that is his right to be religious. If a Christian business doesn't want to open on Sunday, that's also their right. So I don't want anyone to think that this is me attacking a business owner for their religion. My issue with Hobby Lobby is how its owner has weaponized what he calls biblical principles and has used it to exclude others. And that's what I have a problem with. But I just wanted to get that out in the open right away from the start because I know plenty of Christians do not condone these behaviors. So I don't think I really need to add to a stereotype that Christians are starting to get that isn't really that great. But with that being said, of course, let's jump right in and talk about what Hobby Lobby has done in the name of religion and their multiple controversies. To start with, Hobby Lobby first opened in 1972. Their website paints an inspirational story and it reads, in 1970, David and Barbara Green took out a $600 loan to begin making miniature picture frames out of their home. Two years later, the fledgling enterprise opened a 300 square foot store in Oklahoma City and Hobby Lobby was born. Today, with more than 900 stores, Hobby Lobby is the largest privately owned crafts and arts retailer in the world with over 43,000 employees and operating in 46 states. They also state on this Our Story page that Mardell Christian and Education Supply, an affiliate company, offers books, Bibles, gifts, church and education supplies, as well as a homeschooling curriculum. They state they are committed to honoring the Lord in a way we all do by operating the company in a manner consistent with biblical principles, offering our customers exceptional selection and value, serving our employees and their families by establishing a work environment and company policies that build character, strengthen individuals and nurture families, providing a return on the family's investment, sharing the Lord's blessings with our employees and investing in our community. And remember this, according to Hobby Lobby, these are their goals and this is what they believe in. And I have no issue with this, but Hobby Lobby clearly isn't just a Christian craft store or else I obviously wouldn't be making this video. Now, the first issue many people have with these beliefs is where the money from Hobby Lobby goes. The Green family apparently donates millions to anti-LGBTQ groups, such as the Alliance Defending Freedom. You have also probably heard that name before. The ADF famously represented Jack Phillips of Masterpiece Cake Shop, who refused to create a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. There's been a lot of legal debate on the topic since the Supreme Court ruled in Phillips' favor, but didn't recognize a broad right to discriminate. So if part of your business model is discriminating against someone for their sexual preference, then I have the right to know that and I have the right to not give my money to you and to let other people know. So I'm just gonna say that's kind of fair. If you wanna be a piece of shit, I get to tell people about it, right? I can't tell Green how to spend his money and since it's his money and not the company's, at least to my understanding, then it's his business, not mine. We will get back to this later, but my point is that I don't have to like it or agree with it or support Hobby Lobby because of it, because what he's doing isn't illegal. However, their actions in 2012 are even more frustrating and where we can see this strong religious mindset come into conflict with how they operate as an actual business. So in 2012, David and Barbara Green took a public stance against Obamacare, not only as an individual, but as a company. In a statement reprinted by Business Insider, David said, "'My name is David Green, "'and I am the founder and CEO of Hobby Lobby Stores, Inc. "'My family has been an integral part of this business since day one "'and remains an important part of it today. 
Another integral part of Hobby Lobby from day one has been our faith. My parents were both pastors and all my siblings are involved in ministry. I feel like somewhat of an outsider going into retail, but I've always found a way to minister through Hobby Lobby. We have always operated our company in a manner consistent with biblical principles, including integrity and service to others. We believe wholeheartedly that it is by God's grace and provision that Hobby Lobby has been successful. Therefore, we seek to honor him in all that we do. As part of that faith, we care greatly for our employees and their families. That's why unlike most major retailers, we are only open 66 hours per week and are closed on Sundays to allow our employees to spend time with their families. For the past four years in a row, we have increased the minimum wage for our full-time employees and it's now 80% above the national minimum wage. We also believe in sharing our faith, which is why we purchase full page ads at Christmas and Easter in newspapers in all the major cities where we operate. We also contribute both time and funds to numerous Christian organizations across the nation and the world. Hobby Lobby has always been a tool for the Lord's work. For me and my family, charity equals ministry, which equals the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so far, I don't really have too much of an issue with this. I've had to summarize a little bit here and there so it doesn't sound repetitive, but legally and from an unbiased perspective, I can't really fault David here. His beliefs and those Christian organizations, the anti-LGBTQ ones anyway, aren't what I'd support, but he's been transparent about what Hobby Lobby stands for. And as long as people know that and who they're giving their money to, then I suppose that's okay in my book, at least because it's not illegal right now. I don't know if I'd call supporting a bakery that refused service to a gay couple doing the Lord's work, given what the Bible says about showing kindness and compassion to people and welcoming others, but David has the freedoms to support what he wants. However, it's what he says in the next part of the statement that really bothers me the most. But now our faith is being challenged by the federal government. The Health and Human Services Preventative Services Mandate forces businesses to provide the morning after and the week after pills in our health insurance plans. These abortion-causing drugs go against our faith and our family is now being forced to choose between following the laws of the land that we love or maintaining the religious beliefs that have made our business successful and have supported our families and thousands of our employees and their families. We simply cannot abandon our religious beliefs to comply with this mandate. And this is where I have my first gigantic issue with Hobby Lobby. Personal disagreements in how to treat people is one thing, but this is where I feel it takes a turn from personal conviction to undeniably fucked up. That first sentence gets to me a little more than anything. Our faith is being challenged by the federal government. Like what? The government is not suppressing anyone's belief. And if you've had a flourishing, obviously Christian business up until this point, like they're really not gonna fuck with you. Plus, calling the morning after pill abortion causing is beyond frustrating because it's horribly inaccurate and those pills are meant to prevent a pregnancy from happening in the first place so abortions don't even have to happen because it prevents the fertilization of the egg. I'm not trying to turn this into a pro-life or pro-choice debate here. This is literally just a fact. Like if you're already pregnant, those pills do not work on you. It cannot cause an abortion. NPR even quoted David's statement and explained the morning after pill he's referring to is sold under the brand name Plan B. The week after pill, which actually only works for five days after unprotected sex is called Ella. Both are classified by the Food and Drug Administration as contraceptives. Neither is the same as the abortion drug RU486 or Mifeprex. That pill isn't considered a contraceptive and isn't covered by the new insurance requirements. The constant references to Plan B and Ella as abortion-causing pills frustrates Susan Wood, a professor of health policy at George Washington University and a former assistant commissioner for women's health at the FDA. It is not only factually incorrect, it is downright misleading. And their only connection to abortion is that they can prevent the need for one. Though there has been debate about Plan B and if it works before or after fertilization, there's been fairly definitive research that shows it only works by preventing ovulation. So even if David Green believes that the second an egg is fertilized, it is immoral to abort, these plan B morning after pills aren't getting rid of fertilized eggs or pregnancies to begin with, which technically means that the pill is actually in line with his message. It's preventing the thing he doesn't want happening. Anyway, also according to NPR, Ella, the week after pill is even given to rape victims in Catholic hospitals in Europe because while these Catholic hospitals may have pro-life values, 
they can be unbiased enough to look at the data and research done to realize that no abortions are going on here and that these pills can truly help the women that are in need of them. And yet somehow Hobby Lobby just can't figure that one out. Again, there's a ton of evidence that shows these emergency contraceptives delay the release of the egg itself. But there's debate that because it can't technically stop implantation, some of these pills have been mislabeled for saying they can. Regardless though, they are not abortion pills and that's not what the laws were trying to ensure by any means. Yet in large part because of Hobby Lobby, the Supreme Court had to review the contraceptive mandate and on July 13th, 2013, a district judge, Joe Heaton, granted the company a temporary exemption from the contraceptive providing mandate. But in June, 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that Hobby Lobby and other closely held stock corporations could be exempt from the law based on religious preferences. The Wall Street Journal reported breaking 5-4 along the justices' conservative liberal divide, the final decision of the court's term extended the religious protections enjoyed by people and churches to certain employers. In one of the most important rulings on religion in years, the decision handed both political parties a rallying point for the midterm elections. A corporation is simply a form of organization used by human beings to achieve desired ends, just as Samuel Alito wrote for the majority. Protecting the free exercise rights of corporations like Hobby Lobby, Conestoga, and Mardell, the for-profit employers that objected to covering emergency and certain other contraceptives in their health plans protects the religious liberty of the humans who own and control those companies, he wrote. The dissenting liberals led by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said the court's majority had exalted the religious views of a handful of business owners over the public interest. In this case, extending healthcare to women of childbearing age. Working for Hobby Lobby or Conestoga, in other words, should not deprive employees of the preventative care available to workers at the shop next door, Justice Ginsburg wrote. She was joined in whole by Justice Sonia Sotomayor and in large part by Justices Stephen Breyer and Elena Kagan. And again, I know it's hard to remain unbiased and unpolitical about things, but I do believe that you should be able to have access to healthcare. I don't really think that should be an argument and I don't know why it is. But either way, Hobby Lobby did legally win in this case. At least that's how they went about this in a legal matter instead of just ignoring the law and doing as they please, like I've seen plenty of times on this channel before. However, it's some of their other controversies as well, like at least in my opinion, that are far more black and white in terms of just the fuckery this company has been pulling. So the next issue I have with Hobby Lobby is sort of a mix of hilariously stupid, illegal, and just stunning, honestly. I feel like some of you might not even believe me when I tell you what they did because of just how ridiculous this actually sounds. So Hobby Lobby was trying to sponsor the Museum of the Bible. And in their journey of trying to find religious artifacts for this museum, they smuggled in illegal and fake purchases from Iraq. And no, I'm not kidding. Steve Green, David's son, co-founded the museum and blamed inexperience for this uh, mishap, shall we say. According to NBC, he said he didn't appreciate the complexity of the acquisitions process and relied on dealers and shippers who didn't know how to document and send the items. This resulted in some regrettable mistakes, the company said in a statement. And if that's not the understatement of the year, then woo, oh boy. So these Hobby Lobby reps were warned that the items that they purchased could be fake, but they went ahead and funded this museum anyway. According to the New York Times, in July, 2017, just four months before the museum was set to open, federal prosecutors in New York announced that Hobby Lobby and the Greens had acquired in 2010, at least 5,500 artifacts fraught with red flags from dubious dealers in the United Arab Emirates. They had also allowed the objects to be shipped to the company's headquarters in Oklahoma City, misleadingly described as ceramic tile samples, according to prosecutors. Hobby Lobby relinquished those items and paid a $3 million fine. When the museum later opened on November 17th, 2017, the Greens seemed confident their troubles were behind them. Steve Green spoke of the museum as non-sectarian and said of the Bible, let it have an impact in your life as it has my life or our family's life and so many people all over the world. We don't hold any concerns about our collections, Stephen Bickley, the museum's vice president of marketing, told The Atlantic just before the museum opened. 
Indeed, a year earlier in 2016, the museum had even put out a scholarly ebook, now discredited, and touted the so-called Dead Sea Scroll fragments as an especially important addition to known material. But the legacy of its original collecting practices remained and became the focus of an inquiry by a team of investigators hired by the museum to analyze its 16 scroll fragments. Hired under the proviso so it could act with full independence and present its findings free of interference, the team published its results on March 13. It found, as first reported by National Geographic, that not only were the fragments fake, but they were deliberate forgeries created in the 20th century. Two weeks later, Steve Green announced another embarrassing gaffe. The museum, as first reported by the Wall Street Journal, would be sending another 11,500 artifacts, 5,000 papyri fragments, and 6,500 clay objects back to Iraq and Egypt because of insufficient provenance. In a long statement, Mr. Green admitted that he had trusted the wrong people to guide me and unwittingly dealt with unscrupulous dealers when buying the items. Pride comes before a fall, right? Isn't that how the saying goes? Something like that? I don't know. He thought there was nothing more wrong with the collection and yet more of it was even proven to be fake. It's just, it's so stupid and it's also such a dangerous problem to have. What it shows is that Hobby Lobby can't really be trusted with money like if this is how they're going to spend their millions. Again, I do have to concede that of course they are a private company so they can run themselves into the ground at their own leisure, of course. But I'm just saying, it's kind of funny to watch from the sidelines. Like seriously, they put millions into the black market and nearly spread misinformation to all of their museum visitors. Like if you can't even trust a museum to tell you the truth about a topic or for a place to get information, then who the hell can you trust? One or two forgeries would be one thing, but well over a million dollars worth and all of it directly tied to Hobby Lobby. Like it's as infuriating as it is stupid. It truly is. Experts on cultural law warned them Hobby Lobby didn't listen. So they're actually getting what they deserve here and any repercussions that come forward. Hell, some of these supposedly weren't even good forgeries. So it just looks even worse as you keep digging into this. If the Greens were going to say that they're confident in the rest of the collection, then maybe they should have examined it, you know, just to make sure. And not to mention, Every shipment found by CPB lacked the correct customs documentation and had shipping labels that falsely and misleadingly identified the documents as ceramic tiles or clay tiles, the DOJ said. The labels also said the artifacts hailed from Turkey, a country that doesn't have the same importing requirements as Iraq. Other items were shipped from Israel and falsely declared to be from the same country. It's unclear if Hobby Lobby knew the items were illegally smuggled. And that is where I'll actually give Hobby Lobby the benefit of the doubt. And I'll say that I don't think they were actually aware that the items were illegally smuggled. But not being aware of the law still is not an excuse to break it. And this level of ignorance just really hits dangerous levels. They're just casually supporting the black market. So who knows where this money truly went or what it was even used for. But you know, Hobby Lobby just gave it away cause lol. Now, the other three controversies involving Hobby Lobby are a little bit smaller, not necessarily because they're not as important, but there is just less to talk about. One of these is the fact that Hobby Lobby believes in converting people at work. In 2010, Green said, I would like to know that we have brought as many people to know Christ as we possibly can. We hope to continue to just grow our company. As long as there's someone on this earth that doesn't know Jesus Christ, we have a job to do. The company stresses that the beliefs of its owners are not forced upon employees in any way, but it says it offers a path to religion for those who want it. Hobby Lobby has three chaplains dedicated to ministers, to workers, and Green said four years ago that hundreds of employees had been converted, including more than a dozen managers in a single year. We prayed a prayer with them, and we did have 15 managers come to know Christ in the business place, he said. Hobby Lobby may claim that they don't force their beliefs on their employees, but other sources say otherwise. And this, if you ask me, is the real, real fucking bullshit here. They don't want the Supreme Court pushing its beliefs on them, but they see no problem with pushing their beliefs on employees. And that's hypocritical as hell. And I don't know how they can't see that. According to the Country Herald in central Illinois, Green has a long history of pushing beliefs on his employees through ownership. This article brought up these issues after critiquing the second controversy with Hobby Lobby, how they handled the pandemic. 
According to Daily Mail, arts and crafts giant Hobby Lobby is slowly shutting down stores across the country amid intense criticism about a letter claiming the company's boss's wife had a vision from God telling the chain to stay open. Calls to stores around the country show some are open, some are closing, while others just don't know what is going on. The confusion follows a letter sent to stores last week by Chief Executive David Green, who said his wife Barbara had a heavenly vision about the coronavirus. Many store employees took that as a message that the stores should stay open because God would protect them from the illness. Green called his 76-year-old wife his family's prayer warrior in the letter. While we do not know for certain what the future holds or how long this disruption will last, we can all rest in knowing that God is in control, Green wrote. The company's leaders are doing all they can to balance the need to keep the company strong and the needs of employees. To help ensure our company remains strong and prepared to prosper once again when this passes, we may all have to tighten our belts over the near future, he said. Yeah, we'll all have to uh, tighten our belts, as in his employees would go without pay, while David Green, billionaire, lives it up in his mansion. What a fucking disgrace. First of all, Hobby Lobby tried to claim that they were an essential service and that's how they tried to stay open initially in the midst of a pandemic. And then when they finally do close after cease and desist letters, their employees have no pay. So which is it Hobby Lobby? You act like you're so important and essential, but then you tell your own employees that you can't afford to give them leave time? I know Hobby Lobby isn't the only company that did this, but I want them to get back to their own commitment from their website. For a reminder, here's two of them. Serving our employees and their families by establishing a work environment and company policies that build character, strengthen individuals, and nurture families. Providing a return on the family's investment, sharing the Lord's blessings with our employees and investing in our community. Hobby Lobby's employees need their bosses now more than ever, and those monetary blessings more than ever too. Green is a multi-billionaire. He's worth four and a half billion dollars, but he's not serving his employees and the Greens aren't sharing with their employees either. Especially in a time of need, they say, hey, take advantage of unemployment. We can't help you. That's not very Christian-like, is it? Now, the third controversy is a bit smaller and one that I'm adding almost as an afterthought, but one Hobby Lobby employee was anti-Semitic to a Jewish shopper when they told the shopper they couldn't cater to you people after the shopper was looking for Jewish holiday crafts. Hobby Lobby issued an apology, made a statement, and the Anti-Defamation League accepted the apology. I don't think Hobby Lobby is necessarily anti-Semitic because of this as they didn't tolerate the employee's comment, but it did happen all the same. At least nothing like it has been reported, if anything else has been going on at least, so that's left unclear. Hobby Lobby isn't required to have every single craft item from every religion either, especially when the stores made it clear that they are in line with Christian values and Christian values only. The reason I bring up the scandal at all is because yet again, it's just another example of hypocrisy. Hobby Lobby doesn't want to cater to others and carry menorahs for Jewish holidays. They don't want those beliefs pushed on them and they aren't obligated to sell them. Yet they promote anti-LGBTQ foundations that advocate for pushing that belief onto others. The ADF that they donate millions to supports the recriminalization of sexual acts between consenting LGBTQ adults and claims that a homosexual agenda will destroy society. Michael Ferris, a Baptist minister, was appointed CEO at ADF and he has one hell of a disturbing hate-filled history, which by the way, that could make a spicy video just in of itself because it's so fucked up. But anyway, this is the message he promotes today, of course, and it's no different. It's pretty consistently hateful. ADF's longstanding antipathy towards LGBTQ people has become public through its work on lawsuits, various statements its leaders have made and materials it has offered on its website over the years. It has also promoted the idea of a homosexual agenda, a nefarious scheme to destroy Christianity and eventually civilization through LGBTQ people's efforts to secure equality under the law. To those who believe in this conspiracy today, LGBTQ people are not really seeking equality. Rather, they are actually seeking to destroy such things as Christianity, the family, and culture. And it comes as no surprise here, but they've also equated homosexuality to pedophilia and advocated for ex-gay conversion therapy. Not agreeing with the LGBTQ community is certainly one messed up thing, but this goes entirely beyond just being like, I'm not comfortable with it or whatever, to just hateful and destructive. 
I think it's pretty obvious to a lot of you guys, but I obviously do support the LGBTQ community. It's hard to not support something that you're a part of. And I've made that pretty clear in past videos. And I know in the comment section, I'm definitely gonna get some people that are gonna disagree with me about this kind of stuff, but like, you know, everyone has an asshole and everyone has an opinion. And I don't wanna see your asshole and I don't care about your shit opinion either. It's hateful, inhumane treatment that I can't tolerate and I have to shut it down immediately because the shit that I just read from this fucking group, it's fucked up on a whole other level. And this is who Hobby Lobby literally gives millions of dollars to every single year. They support this message of hate and that's the biggest reason why I'll never support Hobby Lobby in turn. So with all of that being said, that's where I'm gonna end today's video. It was a little bit of everything all over the place. Sorry to end it on such a negative note. I just, uh, I, I have some feels towards this in case you couldn't tell. I really hope you learned something in today's video and did enjoy that. So if you did, please hit the thumbs up button. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe and make sure to share this around, family, friends, you know, whoever. More people obviously need to know and understand the messages behind Hobby Lobby. If you guys want to see more content from me as well, you can pop open my description box. You're gonna find links for everything, including my soap channel, my puppies channel, collaboration with Sad Milk, all the good stuff. Links for everything will be down below. So again, guys, thank you so much for making it to another video. I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.